Well, hello everyone. I wish I could be there in person, but uh, it's a long ways to travel for um, for a one day meeting. So I'm happy to be here with you uh, virtually. So what I want to tell you about is a project um, that is near and dear to my heart. I'm the principal investigator on it. Uh, it's a NASA funded project called Lake Observations by Citizen Scientists and Satellites, or LOCS. And as you can see, I have a many, many collaborators on this project, including um, at least one in Europe, uh, Jean-Francois Croteau in, uh, in uh, France. So um, what I want to start off with is rather than digging into citizen science, I want to start by just thinking about lakes a little bit. And I want you to think about this question. How many lakes larger than one hectare, so 100 meters by 100 meters, do you think there are in the world? And just take a minute to think about what your guess would be. So the correct answer to this is that there's something like 6 million such lakes in the world. And we know this from uh, being able to observe them by satellite images. And almost all of those lakes are completely unmonitored. We have no idea how water level or water storage in those lakes is going up or down. And that really matters because as the water cycle is changing, right, these lakes are sort of like these gauges of the water cycle in the basins that drain into them, right? If they're, if, if they're increasing in, in, in water storage, then that tells us overall that there's probably a, a, an excess of water uh, in most cases in, in, in the basin draining in uh, relative to, uh, to, to, to prior times. And if they're losing water, then that tells us the opposite. So we've got about 10 to 20,000 uh, lakes worldwide where we actually have good on the ground measurements, which means that the vast majority of lakes, we have no idea what's going on. So um, to try to get at uh, addressing this problem, I think that there are two directions that we wanna combine. And those two directions are in the name of our project, citizen science and satellites. So what we do is um, we start by working with citizen scientists to text us in measurements of water level in lakes. And I'll describe a little bit about how this works, but basically we install simple staff gauges, simple rulers in lakes, along with signs on top of those rulers. And then we combine those uh, uh, information uh, that are provided by citizen scientists from those um, gauges with satellite measurements in a couple of different contexts. So the first is that we can combine satellite measurements of lake area, right? So we can very easily tell what, what the area of a lake is on a particular day. You can see these, these black features in this, in this Landsat image are, are lakes in, here in North Carolina. And so we can see um, how lake area changes. And if citizen scientists measure um, water level changes in the lake, we can combine those to see how the, the amount of water stored in a lake or a reservoir is changing over time. So um, how does the citizen science component of this uh, work in a little bit more detail? Well, we, we go ahead and we install um, one of these gauges. And um, at the beginning of our project, we did all of the installations because we really needed to figure out how this was gonna work. And we've realized that in some cases, we still need to do the installations, but in a lot of cases, we actually have interested citizen scientists who are very capable of, of going and installing a gauge themselves in a lake if we just send them the materials. And so in some cases now we're just uh, sending people on, um, you know, th uh, the sign and the gauge. And then uh, oftentimes we'll just uh, give them a credit at a, at a hardware store um, for, you know, for a, a certain amount of money or, or, or place an order for them at a local hardware store that they can go pick up for the rest of the materials. <laughs> so it's pretty straightforward to install. And then essentially what we do uh, in most cases, people will just send in, in a simple text message, right? And, and they'll send in a gate, a, 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 a code to a particular phone number along with the water level. And then they can include a comment if they want to afterwards. And immediately they get feedback. We, we thank them for participating in the project. And then we tell them what the... Um, what the uh, last water level was that was measured at this gauge and when it was measured. And we give them a link to our website where they can go and see all of the data that, uh, that's been entered uh, in real time, right? So as soon as someone texts in a measurement, as long as our, um, 
uh, sort of algorithms for detecting uh, problematic measurements don't get flagged, it gets immediately added to uh, to a plot and you can immediately see sort of uh, the full and updated time series. So how good are these measurements? This is always a question that we get with, with citizen science measurements and the answer is really, really good. So uh, what we did is we, uh, without telling our citizen scientists, we installed automated pressure transducers in 22 lakes for between three and nine months. And these, so these log water level every 15 minutes, the error on them is roughly eight millimeters. And you can see in this scatter plot, the relationship between the water levels measured by citizen scientists and measured by um, loggers. And the mean absolute error is about 16 millimeters, about 1.6 centimeters, which I, uh, you know, that is, it's a little bit higher maybe than, 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 the, than the automated uh, pressure transducer, right? We have some outliers where probably someone, uh, you know, made a mistake in, in, in what they texted in, but the vast majority of the measurements are, are, are really good. And frankly, from a, like a water management perspective, in terms of understanding what's going on in, in these lakes, it's completely within the range of what we need. So we feel really good about the quality of the data that citizen scientists are providing. Um, so then what we do is essentially we combine uh, this information, as I said, with uh, measurements from Landsat, so a U.S. satellite and Sentinel-2, a European satellite, um, of, of lake uh, water area. And um, one of the things that we do, right, is we don't get overpasses of satellites every day. So for people who sign up and are interested, we send them an email the day before there's going to be a satellite overpass. And we say, hey, could you go out tomorrow and make a measurement? Because then we can match it up. And what we found is that um, in lakes where we do this, we get 71% of our lakes measured on, on, on requested days, plus or minus a day, right? So we could get it a measurement the day before or the day after. But I, you know, we found this kind of communication to be really effective. And you know, in our project, and I'll talk about this a little bit more I, when I show when I show some of the aggregate data. As in most citizen science projects, right, we have a very large number of not super highly engaged uh, participants who might send in just one measurement ever. They might be walking by a gauge in a lake, see it, and say, "Oh, cool! I'll text something in," and that's the extent of what they do. And then we have a a, a smaller number of very engaged. Uh, participants who sometimes might have sent in hundreds of measurements over the lifetime of the project. And so those people, uh, the, the really engaged folks, are oftentimes the ones who are um, receiving and responding to these uh, to these emails. And so then what essentially what we can do is uh, we can we can uh, use uh, this this um, information from uh, from from Landsat along with some historical Landsat data. And we can calculate, uh, we, we can take the lake levels from citizen scientists, combine the, them with lake surface areas um, from satellite data, and uh, essentially combine those to get changes in lake volume over time. And in most of the lakes we're working in, honestly, these signals are really dominated by uh, the lake level changes. But there are cases where that is not true, right? So actually, if I go back really quickly, blue in this image shows um, a case where um, a lake is extremely stable over time, where, where what's water is pretty much always water. But there are cases, right? So one of the countries that we're working in is Bangladesh, where there are these enormous changes in water level seasonally, or, or pardon me, in, 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 in inundated areas, so not just water level. And so in those cases, we really need to factor in um, changes in inundation extent from satellite images in addition to the water level uh, changes that, uh, the, that citizen scientists are measuring. And this does happen in the US as well. So this is just an example in Wisconsin, right? So not all US lakes are incredibly stable. So uh, we started uh, the LOX project in 2017. So we've been going for, uh, we're in our sixth year now. And uh, these are some stats about the project. So uh, we have made measurements in, in uh, over 250 lakes. We've engaged uh, about 6,700 citizen scientists. Um, with about 1,200 of them having submitted at least uh, two measurements, more than one measurement. Um, about 500 of them have gone to more than one lake and, and, and provided measurements. And we've had one person who's provided over 600 measurements. In total, uh, we're just approaching our, our 60,000th measurement. 
So we're starting to get to the point where we have um, quite a bit of data and we can do some interesting things with, uh, with this data, which is, which is uh, cool. Um, but before I talk about some of the things that we're starting to do, um, I just wanna show you the, the current extent. So we have a lot of uh, gauges in, uh, in, in the US. We're ex we, we've expanded in Canada a bit uh, recently. We have a partner, as I mentioned, in, in France. So uh, we have um, gauges uh, in uh, the Pyrenees, in lakes in the Pyrenees. So if you're, uh, if you're going, going to go and uh, walk the GR10, uh, some of those uh, gauges are, are right along that, uh, that uh, track. And so um, definitely keep an eye out and, uh, and, and send us some measurements. And then we have partners in South Asia. So Bangladesh is our biggest partner. They're, they've uh, made really substantial use of, of these data to help them understand what the total volume of water is that, that inundates the country during the wet season relative to the dry season uh, before our project. That was not something that had been well quantified. And then we also have partners in Pakistan, Nepal, and, and, and India. We're working on more uh, gauges in Canada, and then we're looking to add uh, Chile very soon. We already have uh, all the permissions in place, and uh, we're just uh, waiting a, in the next couple of weeks to install our first gauge, and then we're working uh, with uh, on on that in Colombia as well. So, um, what can we do uh, with with these data? Well, one of the questions that we can try to address is how similar are water levels in in lakes that are nearby each other versus further away, and so. What we can do is uh, these are two time series from two lakes in North Carolina that happen to be right next to each other. And you can see that they're pretty highly correlated, right? So they're not maybe absolutely perfect, but you know, there's certainly, you know, when you have high water levels in Jones Lake, you also tend to have high water levels in, in, in Salters Lake. And you know, what this is telling us, right, is hey, we have two lakes that are near near each other. They're pretty similar. What if we look at a lake that's a, that's a little bit further away? So these two are up here. What if we look at uh, at one that's that's uh, you know this is probably thirty kilometers away? Does it look the same as well? And the answer is not nearly as 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 uh, as similar. So there are some similarities, but uh, these time series are, are are much more dissimilar than the two lakes that are that are right near each other. So um you know this uh, it it might seem obvious that uh, that this is true, but fundamentally we have not before had enough. Um, data, especially in smaller lakes, to be able to look over entire regions and say, okay, if we're measuring one or two lakes in this region, is that really characterizing the, what's going on in lakes in the whole region? Or are things changing more on a lake-by-lake -lake basis? And so um, we've uh, we, we, we published a paper on this. I'm not going to go into too much more detail. But uh, the answer, it turns out, is that, yeah, there is some regional coherence, but maybe less than you would think. And actually, lake by lake variation um, in in water levels, even between lakes that are pretty close to each other, is actually often quite large. So we can't just measure a few lakes in a region, oftentimes, and um, and just uh, assume that they that, that those lake lakes represent everything that's going on in the region. So the other thing that we're using uh, these data for is uh, to evaluate satellite measurements. So we have satellite altimeters. Um, that are that, that uh, were prim primarily designed to monitor oceans, but we have repurposed them to also monitor lakes, and this has been going on since at least the 1990s. Um, a lot of these are actually European satellites, so so uh, uh, the Sentinel three satellites are probably the best ones that are out there right now. And so what we can do though is uh, there's been a lot of literature that's been published on evaluating how well uh, we can use these these satellite data to measure water level in lakes. Um, in large lakes, but there really has not been much work done in small lakes. And so what we can do is we can compare our time series of water levels in these small lakes with time series of altimetry data from, from satellites to figure out, can we use satellites to do this well? And so what we're looking at here are just some time series on the, the, uh, the sort of blue dots here are um, water levels from locks. And the red dots are uh, measurements from, from some of these satellite altimeters. And these are all of, of, of variations in water level. And uh, if you look at these, the vast majority of them have statistically significant relationships. And um, 
Some of them are, are, are really quite good, right? So you look at uh, something like Lake Sammamish, which is in Washington state, right? And you have a correlation coefficient of 0.76 here, an RMSE of about, uh, of less than 20 centimeters. And so it's not perfect, right? We do see, we do see things um, in, in, in one time series that we don't see in the others uh, or, or in the other one, but um, we're definitely, even in these relatively smaller lakes, that really aren't varying very much in water level, right? So some of these lakes are varying by well less than a meter. We're still getting useful information from these from these these satellite altimeters, which is which is really exciting. Um, so we're also working on a, sort of a new aspect to our project, which is looking at at lake inundation extent, and and helping us to evaluate satellite measurements of inundation extent. So we've developed an Android app that allows citizen scientists to collect points or lines or polygons representing water land boundaries. So if you have a lake near you and you want to walk along a shoreline, you just basically press a button to start tracking, keep walking along the shoreline. When you're done, press stop and then send us send us the data and we can and uh, we can do this comparison. And so uh, this is something that we're just still piloting. Um, we have the app done and it's going to be released in the uh, in, in sort of the Google um, app store here very shortly. So one of the things I was asked to talk about is sort of what have we learned from locks? What, uh, what do we think has allowed us to be successful to the extent that we've been successful? And I think there are four things that, that, that I've taken away. The first is I think one of the reasons that we've had a lot of engagement is that it's really, really simple to participate. So if you see a gauge on a lake in your area, you know, you don't need any training. You know, we've we've uh, compared um, measurements made by people who've been trained to you know to to make measurements to those who have not been trained, and there's really no difference in accuracy, right? It's very easy to read the water level on the gauge and and just send us a text message, and you know we think that sort of low barrier to entry has been really helpful. The second, though, is that it's been critical for us to have flexibility in data collection methods. So in some parts, essentially in every country, we've done things slightly differently. So for example, I said that Bangladesh was, was one of our really big partners, right? Well, people, I, I, you know, we haven't set up a text message system in Bangladesh like we have in Canada and, and, and the US and Europe. Um, instead, essentially, we use um, data sheets that get aggregated uh, locally. And then um, those get sent to us as essentially as, as a spreadsheet, and then we and then we add the data to um, to our database that way. And uh, you know, essentially the the tech, you know we found that the, that the text message messaging systems uh, there didn't work so well. Similarly, in France, we use text message systems, but most of the lakes that we're working in are, are in places where there is no cell signal. And so essentially, what we've um, what we've done is 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 rather than having an automated system there, um, basically uh, the the text messages get get sent to a number that, that that's then monitored by um, our colleague in France, and he sort of manually enters the data. And so having that kind of flexibility to work with local conditions is really important. Um, we also think that, uh, and this may seem obvious, but building reliable ways to get information back to the citizen scientist, right? So as a, as a scientist who studies satellite imagery, I'm really interested in using this, these, these data for our science. But um, a lot of our citizen scientists are interested in what's happening to their lake. You know, what do water levels look like over time? And so by immediately responding with an automated text message and by providing all of the data in a free and open way without any delays, um, you know, we, uh, we we have citizen scientists who are actively using these uh, th these data, this information about their lakes. So one example that I can think of is um, in Washington State, one of our lakes, uh, depending on the water level, they have rules about um, how fast you can drive your boat, right? And essentially whether you're going to create a wake behind your boat or not. And what they're doing is they're just looking at our gauge. And when it hits a certain threshold, that's how they essentially make their their uh, decision about okay you know we're going to implement our rule where you can't have a wake anymore because the water level is too low and so um you know they're actively using these data in their decision making and the reason that's possible is that the data are immediately available and visible to everyone right you can just go and check the website 
So the final point I would make is that it's been absolutely critical for us to work with local partners. You know, we've had to, we've had to have the flexibility to work with them, but we need permission to install gauges in lakes, and uh, we need uh, help with recruiting people who might be interested in sending in measurements. And we also need to know which lakes are important in a particular region, right? Are there places where 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 uh, local residents are really interested in what's going on in a particular lake? That would tend to be a really good target for us. And so, um, you know, the only way we've really been successful is by working directly with people on the ground um, in the in the states and countries where uh, where we're working. So um, we've got another about three years of funding from NASA to keep locks going. And uh, we are uh, working on actively expanding. So if you have a lake in your area that you think might be a great target, um, I'm very easy to find online and uh, I'd, I'd be happy to, to get any, uh, any emails. And for now, I'm happy to take questions. <laughs>